Thank you, Richard. Um, there are a few questions uh, on the Q&A if you'd like to take some of those uh, live. I can do that. Um, here, give me a second. Let me stop my sharing. All right, here we go. How, how about I just read you one right now? Um, can Raytune also spit out the posterior of hyperparameters and posterior predictive of the neural net using those hyperparameters? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, I think the main focus of Raytune is to provide an execution framework. Um, and again, as mentioned in the talk, Raytune integrates with all sorts of different optimization libraries, specifically these model-based optimization libraries. These model-based optimization libraries typically build a model, uh, a, a predictive model over the hyperparameter space. And those uh, are typically usable to be uh, to be queried for um, for stereo values, and so uh, so to answer this question, uh, it depends on the particular library you're using for optimization. Would you like us to read the other questions, or you'd like to uh, choose them yourself? Yeah, I, I could I could choose I could actually go through this myself. Okay. Um, right, so. <clears throat> um, let's see. So, so one one question was, um, how can Slurm be used with, or sorry, yeah, how can Slurm be used with Ray, and what is involved in specifying available resources to Ray? So yeah, this is a great question. Um, essentially, you can query Slurm. You you request Slurm to to provide multiple nodes. And um, what you need to do is you just need to start the Ray service on top of each one of them. Uh, we have documentation uh, about how to how to run Ray with Slurm, and uh, from what I understand, Mustafa is also on this. So um, I personally don't use Slurm; I'm more based on the cloud. But uh, there's many users that have gotten this working, and if you run into questions or issues running the um, running the, the examples on the documentation, you can feel free to reach out on the Slack. Yeah, so we have also the, as you mentioned, the Slurm um, uh, nurse repo uh, with examples of how to actually build a Ray cluster uh, with Slurm. Um, so uh, I can refer you to that on Slack if you send me a message on the lecture channel. So another question about Slurm was, there was a time limit on jobs. How does Ray handle that property for restarting of Slurm jobs? Right, so um, right now we don't have automatic restarting. However, Tune has um, automatic checkpointing. So it can um, essentially allow you to, uh, in certain configurations, you can restart the tuning job from exactly where you left off. Um, so I guess a more general question for for term is, um, or I guess for Ray is, does it handle node failures? Like what happens when a node goes down? Um, so typically Ray is uh, fault tolerant. So that means that if uh, one node, uh, one of the worker nodes go down, um, like the the, term, uh, the Ray job continues to run. However, I think um, if the entire cluster goes uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult. All right, um, let's see. So, oh, as a rule of thumb, which hyperparameters often give the most, the biggest bang for the buck uh, to tune? So, so um, this is a great question. Uh, and I was actually pretty surprised when I, I saw one of the importance plots um, when, of my typical hyperparameter tuning run. So. I think by default, the most, the most important hyperparameter is, is learning rate. It's, it is attributed essentially to um, like, I think the important, like whatever metric was roughly like 70% of the performance uh, across all the, um, all the different hyperparameters that I was sweeping over was attributed to learning rate. And it's been over and over again that learning rate tends to be, um, what really decides how how well your uh, your model, deep learning model is performing. 
Um, so yeah, and I guess for random forests, you probably end up with like the size of the estimators and the number of estimators and the, the depth of the tree. Those typically are the, um, the, the most important um, hyperparameters. Yeah, but I guess as general, I, I, there's, um, since there's so many machine learning models, like I can only speak about probably the two most general ones. Um, let's see, so, um, yeah, so one, 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 one of the attendees asked, um, you mentioned um, Raytune was made with deep learning in mind. So does it work well with other machine learning models? And the answer is yes. You can, you can essentially provide any um, deep learning model, or sorry, any machine learning model, anything that actually just returns a, a sort of objective function. And Tune uh, essentially allows you to orchestrate and execute a, um, a essentially an optimization uh, process over over this object this objective function providing uh, Python object. Um, so, oh, one question was, <clears throat> or I guess two questions were, how do you specify the algorithm for uh, tuning a rate tune? And Richard mentioned that there was built-in support for scikit optimize. I was wondering how this is specified. So right, so this is a great question. I think where you want to go is you want to go to um, the documentation page. So actually, let me just quickly do a walkthrough of the documentation page. I, maybe that'd be helpful. Um, the let me give me a second. Right, so here we have um, docs.ray.io. Right, so here's the, or maybe I should do a lot larger. Here's the Ray documentation. If you go down to um, tutorials and guides, there's a quick walkthrough of all the concepts that you might want to know. And, um, what the attendee is asking for specifically about how to choose optimizer is uh, what we call a search algorithm, right? So the search algorithm, for example, here, we're using a wrapper around a popular library called Hyperopt. And, um, and so if we want to actually use this, you would, as similar to, to presented on the screen, it's just a one line, uh, extension of the tune execution function. Now, if you wanted to look at all the different algorithms that were provided for you, um, here's here's like a list of all the different integrations that you can choose with Raytune, um, and each of them have their own documentation and different uh, features that you could interact with. Um, right, so another question was, how does Ray communicate across nodes? So, um, so Ray does not use files. Um, it opens sockets between different um, nodes and communicates mainly through TCP. Um, MPI, or so Ray does not use MPI underneath the hood, uh, but Ray instances are are able to communicate with each other. Um, right, so yeah, um, another, I guess more specifically, another question was like uh, the distributed aspect of Raytune. So um, specifically how Raytune works is we set up the Ray cluster underneath um, on Slurm and upon the rate cluster, you can execute your, your rate tune uh, tuning run. And so um, Ray provides a really simple abstraction for uh, creating actors, which um, you can think of as, as um, 
distributed Python objects. And these distributed Python objects you can interact with um, through, through the Ray API. So um, specifically for Tune, <clears throat> Tune essentially constructs a bunch of these different objects that get placed across the Ray cluster, these different actors, and um, you can communicate with the actors to uh, retrieve the most recent uh, training result or say um, like change the hyperparameters on that particular object. And um, this allows us to easily implement population-based training and patient optimization. So again, to answer the question, how is communication handled between nodes for Ray Tune? Um, the, the short answer is like using the actor framework provided by Ray. All right. Um, so now there's a couple questions on, um, on a notebook and perhaps I'll just do a, a walkthrough of a notebook on Colab. Um, <clears throat> and I guess we'll do the, well, we can do the TensorFlow um, Colab notebook. And uh, I can also, let me just quickly post the, let me just quickly post the Colab links. Um, so yeah, here is, um, how do I post this? Here, so I posted notebooks. Um, and I'll, I'll just do a quick walkthrough of, of one notebook right now. So, uh, right, so I'm on this, Tune, Ray Tune documentation. Actually, let me just start from the very beginning. So now, for, I guess for the next 20 minutes, I can do a quick walkthrough of how you might use Tune using uh, on, on Colab. And this, again, Colab provides a single node, but <clears throat> the way you <clears throat> program Tune on the cluster is um, the exact same. You don't change any of the code. Um, where you, you add one line of code and there's tutorials as to uh, telling you which line of code that is. And all you need to do is provide a ray, underlying Ray cluster and the same code that you used for tuning on single node can then be scaled to across um, multiple nodes. So um, where I would go first is to the tune tutorials and um, specifically uh, to um, this, this section down below, which is, um, is collab exercises. And so this is a notebook that quickly overviews how you might use Tune on, or actually it's kind of an exercise for how you might use Tune on, um, on provided on Google Colab. It's a very simplistic example, but um, overviews of all the core features that you might be interested in using. So the first thing I'll do is um, I will uh, comment out or I will uncomment the first uh, section which installs dependencies on Colab. And then um, while, while we're waiting for this to so you'll see this, this thing that says your session crashed for unknown reason on the very bottom. Well, that's okay because we had to force a restart of the kernel. So, um, so as a quick walk through this, this tutorial will cover um, uh, kind of the process of visualizing the data so that you kind of understand what we were working with creating a, a, a neural network, so similar to something that you saw last week, but this time using TensorFlow. 
um, tuning this provided model uh, using uh, Raytune and analyzing the model by using some of Raytune's analysis objects. Um, so here we draw a couple of imports and we're gonna be using a data set called Iris. This is a very famous data set that uh, provides a bunch, uh, a couple columns, a couple simple columns on um, some flower characteristics. And um, here we have um, a couple different flower characteristics and you can see a couple of these characteristics are more representative of um, or allow you to sort of um, separate the, the flowers better. So there's three different flowers. They all have different characteristics and some of the characteristics are more telling. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, use this neural network that's already created for us. It's a function that creates a neural network. Um, keep in mind that we're not actually cre uh, instantiating this, this, neuro, uh, this neural network, we're actually just defining it in the function. This is important because um, in order to communicate across nodes, um, Ray depends on serializ serialization. And oftentimes machine learning models um, have trouble being serialized. So serialized essentially means that you are able to um, capture the model in, in a byte representation and then transfer it across the network and reconstruct that byte representation into um, a neural network. Um, so here's another function that we defined. It first, um, it essentially trains the model and um, there is a nice feature in Keras or TensorFlow called a callback, which is um, essentially a hook that gets invoked every couple uh, iterations or probably every iteration, every time you do an update. Here we have a um, callback that, that helps us checkpoint the model so that we can preserve it and save it uh, to use afterwards, after the, the training or tuning process. So um, let's just quickly check that this works and we should see an accuracy of about 0 0.368. So, so that, that was mildly interesting. Um, let's now go to how we might uh, use tune, ray tune with, um, with a callback and with the Keras model. So here we define um, a simple callback. It literally um, take, it's essentially one tune call, which allows us to report um, the training function or the, the training output. You can call this method anywhere within the training function that this, this callback happens to be part of the model, which happens to be invoked um, within the training function. So here's a couple exercises, but I'm just gonna quickly um, add this in. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm porting this again, the same code to um, the, the same code that we saw above to use tune. So the two things that I did was change the signature. So it takes in the hyperparameter space or it takes in a set of hyperparameters. And then I've also configured the, the model creation function that we defined above to use these um, hyperparameters that we've uh, provided through um, this config. So um, what is going to happen now is that this function is actually going to be invoked many times um, across uh, on and in parallel across all the available cores um, in, in your computer. And again, if you're on a cluster, then this function is going to be invoked, you know, 100 times for if you had 100 cores on your cluster. So we'll define that for now. And then the st second step, after we've converted the training function to use tune, we're just going to define a hyperparameter space. So um, what we're going to do specifically is we're going to define the learning rate to have 
a uniform um, distribution over the log space from 0 0.001 to 0 0.1. And then we're going to set some, uh, some model ar architecture parameters. And then we'll also specify um, the number of trials that we're going to evaluate. So um, this is quite simple. We'll just copy this over here. And then we have num samples right here. So hopefully this works out of the box. Um, you might see a couple warning messages, but um, most of them are harmless and disappear after a while. Uh, so what you see on the screen is a refreshing um, or a self-refreshing uh, tabular format that um, tells you what is the current progress of the hyperparameter tuning. It also presents all the different configurations that you're using. So all the different hyperparameters that you're trying in addition to the corresponding accuracy of each hyperparameter. Since we have two CPUs, we're, we're actually just evaluating two, uh, two trials at once. And, um, and everything takes three seconds to evaluate. So um, as this is going, it's actually outputting a couple um, files to this result directory, which you can configure. Um, and with this result directory, you can then specify, you can then use to visualize outputs, or you can, there's a couple log files, such as uh, some CSV formats that you can then also parse yourself. So now we're done with the hyperparameter tuning uh, um, run. And we want to identify what's the best tune model. So um, specifically what we're going to do is we're going to again uh, create this data locally and then we're going to plot it. And see this is our test data. So, um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take this object that we, so this, there's this analysis object it was returned from tune.run, and we're now going to leverage um, a couple of calls, so it's data frame, and also its ability to specify um, the best log directory of the trial. So I guess a, couple, a bit of context here is that we saw that above, um, there was a directory called uh, root slash raid results slash um, Let's see, so there's only one log directory here, this dash to iris. So this is the experiment log directory, but if you look inside, there's actually 20 different uh, folders on the different hyperparameters, the, each of the different trials that we ran. Within any single one of these, um, we actually can see that there's a couple of different files that we can get. In fact, one of them is the model that we saved. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to just use the analysis object that we got from tune.run. And we're going to obtain the best log directory corresponding to this particular metric. Um, minimize, so the, so the best meaning the minimal one. And this validation loss, um, again, was provided through the, the tune callback. So, so there, so we queried, we got the, the directory, we took the model from that directory, and then we, um, we evaluated the model across the test data. It turns out that the tuned accuracy <clears throat> was, was perfect, um, and the untuned model had a accuracy of 0 0.368. And then in comparison to the ground truth, uh, again, we saw that this is perfect. So um, hopefully this one works, uh, but what you can actually do is you can 
use TensorBoard within this Jupyter Notebook to visualize your results too. So what we're going to do is we're going to point it to the experiment directory, which uh, point TensorBoard to the experiment directory, which allows us to um, visualize all the different trials at once. Um, and hopefully this works. All right. It might take a little bit of time to load, but again, so we see all these different accuracy plots, which are generated automatically uh, and plotted automatically with Tune. You can try it for yourself. There's no black magic here. Um, and and, um, and another nice thing is about the visualizations, you can also click the, I think this should work, but I'm not totally sure. Yes, there we go. Um, right, so Tune automatically takes care of the hyperparameter visualization. Uh, which allows you to um, essentially track what type of um, what metrics and how do each metrics uh, correspond to each other. So if we just filter out a couple of these extra metrics that Tune provides, um, what we see is that um, the mean accuracy um, corresponds to it corresponds to a lower learning rate. You'll see that there's a lot of variance across these different dense layers. And my reading on this is that um, there might be an inter, uh, there might be some relationship between dense one and dense two, but most importantly, um, the learning rate is what decides the, the performance of the model. So yeah, so that was the, just a quick overview of how you might use Tune uh, for a typical, a very, very easy hyperparameter tuning um, configuration or hyperparameter tuning run. So Mustafa, what do you think? Uh, what, what should we do? Um, I think we have, we have a lot of questions actually left. Um, um, if you'd like to answer some of them, like one or two questions, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, and we can also post the questions on Slack and then uh, you can answer them later at your own, um, you know, your own time. All right. Um, how about I do, so there's 16 questions. Uh, I'll answer eight and, um, the rest of the, the ones we can do on Slack. So that, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. How many nodes are okay before distributed Bayesian uh, won't be effective? Oh, this is an interesting question. And um, it actually, I would say uh, the correct response for this is to count it in terms of number of parallel trials before distributed Bayesian won't be effective. Um, so the the number of parallel trials um, sort of also correspond to how many you're willing to do at once. So let's say for, for example, you have a hundred different trials that you want to run or you want to you know, evaluate a hundred different trials. If you did um, say like 100 parallel trials at once and you had, um, or you had you know, hundred parallel GPUs that you could access, then running 100 trials at once um, will not allow you to leverage uh, prior information to guide your search. However, if you only had one GPU, then you every single one of these 100 samples that you're going to run is going to be after the other and they can build upon each other. Um, and if you do something like, uh, like you said, say you have 20 GPUs and you want to evaluate 100 different trials, um, you're there's going to be a delayed feedback. So let's say you have like, you run 20 at once in parallel. Um, it's going to take only on the 21st trial will you actually be able to leverage some prior information. So in some sense, um, you won't, um, I guess you don't lose that much if uh, depending on uh, what your configuration is. is but uh, I think the only thing to keep in mind is that there is a delay in feedback and, and um, the first couple runs are not going to be able to leverage um, 
any of the, the current lead training. Like they're not going to be able to leverage this model that you're building up. Let's see. So the spatial optimization and other events methods work well for non-convex problems. So um, my understanding is that deep learning, uh, for the most part, unless you're trying to make a convex problem, is non-convex. And we've seen Bayesian optimization work well for many deep learning methods or deep learning models. Um, what will the, uh, I actually don't quite understand this question. I can answer online later. Mm. In general, how do you decide how many trials to conduct uh, with a given hyperparameter optimization algorithm to ensure that you haven't missed the most optimal regions. Um, so I guess the there's always this this um, illusion of optimality that we get in hyperparameter tuning. Um, essentially, um, if say I had twelve like a dozen hyperparameters, right, and each of them I want to evaluate for three different values, for essentially. Um, I have this, you know, this massive grid of hyperparameters and it's three to the power of 12. That means that if I really want to find the absolute optimal, um, it would take like 500,000 um, evaluations, right? Because there's no, there's no absolute guarantee that any particular uh, parameter that you choose is going to be um, optimal. So, so if you, kind of step away from the sort of optimal mindset and you think about good enough, then what you would probably do is you would design course, uh, a sort of structured iterative process to your hyperparameter tuning. What that means is you'll start with a very coarse grained uh, search and then you'll slowly narrow down the search until um, you've kind of identified and had a good, have a good understanding of how each of the, what are the most important hyperparameters and uh, what would what would be able to be done to in order to uh, optimize performance? And typically, you'll see that um, the hyperparameter tuning uh, methods are only going to provide you a small boost over like some default. And it might be smarter to step back and reevaluate how you're designing your model um, instead of trying to spend so much money or a lot of time like finding the optimal hyperparameters. I would say uh, in terms of research, the most beneficial thing the hyperparameter tuning uh, frameworks can provide is an understanding of the relationships um, uh, that you've designed your model to have. So understanding of the relationships between the hyperparameters. And that's why the parallel coordinates is incredibly important and that's why people are still doing grid search. Um, Does Ray support conditional interactions between hyperparameters? Yes, um, it depends on, also depends on the uh, hyperparameter tuning library that you're using. You typically specify a search space um, within the hyperparameter tuning, uh, or you specify your conditional operators within the hyperparameter tuning space. For example, you might say, hey, I want four layers, but I want one to four layers, but if I had, a fourth layer, then I want to have um, the fourth layer be from 50 to 100 uh, uh, widths. But then if I had three layers, then this like fourth value doesn't really matter. So um, a lot of hyperparameter tuning optimization libraries allow you to specify a search space that, um, that can express this and tune is sort of agnostic to that. Um, Let's see. How, um, what, if anything, does the population based tuning approach do when changing? Ah, so, how does population based training uh, perturb hyperparameters during training? Um, so, what's proposed in the paper is that um, if you have uh, two types of values, you have a Category. If you have a categorical hyperparameter, then um, you can specify a list of different 
categories that you can be choosing from and um, and you can like re-sample from that list every time you do a perturbation. If you have a continuous variable like a learning rate, then the typical perturbation that the paper proposes is to either um, decrease or increase it by a factor of 0 0.8 or increase it by a factor of 1.2. So, um, so I think the caveat here is that these particular parameters that you can perturb are typically not model architecture parameters. The reason is because you can't easily retrain or you can't leverage, um, it's hard to change the model architecture during training. Um, so a lot of, a lot of people just, um, just don't do that. Um, let's see. Um, uh, have you tried this notebook on GPUs? Um, when I do something similar on GPUs with TensorFlow 2, I usually have memory accumulation problems as the GPU memory doesn't clear after each hyperparameter point evaluation. Yeah, so this is in a great question. Um, this notebook does work on GPUs as far as I know. Um, and I guess I'm typically using um, PyTorch, but I am not, uh, I would say the reason why I have a reasonable um, prior as to why uh, why TensorFlow 2 and this particular notebook would work in practice um, with GPUs is because each ray actor is, is terminated after the trial is done. So the ray actor is, again, this distributed object. It runs on a separate Python process, and the memory allocation for a GPU is assigned to a particular Python process. When that Python process dies, it frees up the memory um, used by used on the GPU. And therefore, um, typically we don't see memory leakage um, uh, across off, across different uh, tune trials and across different hyperparameter point evaluations. All right. Um, Richard, I, I, this is probably more than eight questions. So, but if you okay. like answer more, feel free. But if you, uh, if you feel this is yeah, long, then we can answer them on uh, Slack. Yeah, um, I think I'd be happy to answer more questions on Slack. I know. Let me just get some of the earlier um, answers, just in case someone feels that they're getting. Uh, okay. Yeah, so does Raytune implement a semi-parallelized version of Bayesian optimization? Answer is yes. Um, you can specify the maximum concurrency and you can also connect it to a cluster and it'll automatically scale up the Bayesian optimization for you. Um, in parallel. Um, yeah, so I guess I sort of answered this, sec this other question, which was, do you, can you still obtain optimal convergence if you tune hyperparameters individually? Um, so yeah, again, typically your hyperparameters uh, have a, a biased weighting of importance and you'll want to sort of tune like the main most important hyperparameters that you can, that you can find and, um, and sort of the interdependent um, relationships between hyperparameters um, matter, but probably to a lesser extent than the most important default hyperparameters or like the most important hyperparameters such as learning rate or momentum. So um, typically what I would do is I would try to identify interdependence by, by using the sort of parallel coordinate plots. And if I still can't provide or, um, yeah, I would, yeah, that's probably what I would do. And then if I identify something that's particularly interesting, a, a you know, a interaction between hyperparameters, I'll probably run another grid search um over over like a selected evaluation of the hyperparameter space just to test some hypotheses about um the interactions between hyperparameters how do we know who is the best performer in pbt um this is mainly just to you you can identify 
the, the lowest performing model or the best performing model. And that particular model is corresponds to uh, a sequence of perturbations through, um, through the training. So it's not a single trial, but rather, it's not a single hyperparameter evaluation, but a sequence of hyperparameter evaluations. And typically what you can do is you can track them, uh, track this over time. Um, so convergence guarantees, uh, so just, so I guess in practice, convergence guarantees are a good prior for whether or not um, the, the optimization method is going to work in the first place, um, or it's going to be useful in the first place. Uh, yes, many of these hyperparameter tuning model, the models that you're tuning for hyperparameters are non-convex, and um, and so convergence guarantees with hyper. So for for these like um, optimization methods that have convergence guarantees or rate guarantees, um, they're typically not. Um, they're they're a good prior, but they're I guess they're not definitive in that you won't necessarily converge. Um, you won't necessarily get the best model given a traditional optimization method. All right, I think I'll take the rest of the questions on the Slack. Um, but yeah, um, Mustafa, what, what do you think? Yes, that sounds good. So we'll save the rest of the questions and uh, you, know, you can answer them when you have time on Slack. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again. This was uh, the this was yeah very uh, pedagogical actually at so many levels. Uh, I also enjoyed the uh, the demo that you you ran. I think we had also so many questions and a lot of engagement from um, the attendees. Um, so thank you again, Richard, and uh, thank you everyone for joining um, uh, the second week's lecture. I just want to. Um, uh, uh, remind you again that um, uh, we have a lecture every week. We might have a break in the middle on some days. And uh, so please join us uh, next week for the Deep Generative Models talk by Aditya uh, Grover from Stanford University. And um, um, so just so that you know, we have a Slack. If you don't know about the Slack, we have the Slack that you can join through here and uh, you can continue the discussion on particular lectures on the specific uh, channel for that lecture. And also we do link uh, to the slides and the video later. So you find a link to the video here and retro slides, for example. And there's also all the recordings will be available on YouTube, hopefully in one to two days max after the lecture. Thanks again and uh, see you next week. <laughs>